Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 301. Today I am joined by Vic Teslin and Mike Pekovich, and we've got a lot to go over. And today's episode must reach a new high for the number of times Chris Gochner is mentioned. And for good reason, he's a great woodworker. And it just reminded me that we need to have him on the show sometime soon. I got a email from Sarah in marketing, and this one's a doozy. Um, she wanted me to let everyone know that there's special glands on the rear end of a bitterong or a bear cat that excrete a chemical that smells like popcorn, and that we're holding a flash sale on Matt Monaco's bull turning class, $25 off. So you could get in on that class for $149. It'll be open until the end of the class. So if you're late, you can catch up. It's a great class. I've been learning a ton watching the videos myself, and I can't wait to talk to Matt in the Q&A sessions. Also, head on over to findwoodworking.com slash fundamentals and check out the Fundamentals of Woodworking journey with Amanda Russell and Mike Pekovich guiding you through the fundamentals of woodworking and all of the basic stuff that all of us need to know or could probably use a reminder of. So findwoodworking.com slash e-learning and findwoodworking.com slash fundamentals. All right, on with the show. Heartfill Hardware is your woodworking headquarters. That means they carry top tier tools from brands you trust. By now, you know that Heartfill Hardware has the entire Festool line, including the latest Autumn lineup, but they have so much more than Festool to complete your workshop. Heartfill Hardware offers hundreds of woodworking tools and accessories from all of your favorite brands. Visit heartfillhardware.com to shop Robert Sorby, the brand with almost 200 years of experience crafting high quality tools made from high quality steel. Heartfill Hardware carries hundreds of Sorby tools, including turning tools, chucks, and sharpening systems. You can shop Tormek, one of the leading brands in sharpening tools. Head over to heartfillhardware.com to shop the limited edition 50th anniversary sharpening system with a sleek black design and 50 year warranty from Tormek. While you're there, save big on over 200 items from Milwaukee on sale now. Plus, don't forget to visit heartfillhardware.com slash FWW to join their Festool mailing list and be entered for a chance to win a free Festool item. Heartfill Hardware doesn't just provide the tools you need for your workshop, they have all the accessories and gear you need, including durable workwear from Carhartt and drinkware from Yeti to keep you comfortable and refreshed on the job. Shop Heartfill Hardware, your woodworking headquarters. So, Vic, you've been gone a while. What you yeah. been up to, Vic? Hey, what you been up to? Nothing, right? No, Got no. Married. You're married. I'm married now. That's yeah, good. So. About time. Yeah. So Andrea's now. I don't know what that makes her now. That makes you, Mister Paprika. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else is going on, Vic? Um, well, I have, yeah, I have, yeah, forget about that marriage stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget Get about into the, the dirt. Thing. Let's talk about woodworking. Let's talk about woodworking. Okay. So, uh, I have some news to share. Um, I've started cutting pins first. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's come to that. <laughs> this is where like the big screen goes black. <laughs> it's the end of that. <laughs> no. Um, do you want so, to talk about it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could turn this into a little session. Are you we? sure, Vic? It's like, why, this is, why this is a big that? decision. You figure here. you weren't hugged enough as a child. Um, <laughs> you can cut whatever you want to cut for first, people. It doesn't matter. Except it really does. <laughs> um, no. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work down in uh, Australia. And, um, so got to know some people down there and, um, there's a company called Timicon that, um, basically started another company, um, called Melbourne tool company. And so what they realized is something that I think we can all identify with here in North America is that, uh, when it comes to hand tools, there's either like super high end stuff or there's stuff that's kind of like a mm, little sketchy down at the bottom. The stuff at the bottom doesn't really work well and oftentimes gives people a bad go. And then that can 
completely derail somebody. Um, and then the other option, of course, was um, getting a good old, you know, World War One, World War Two era Stanley and putting the grunt work in and getting it going. So what this company down in uh, in Melbourne did is that they basically came up with their own design of hand planes and their uh, their price. They're made now. OK, so they're designed in Melbourne, made in China. Um, and but the quality control is there. Um, you know, the QC is there. The um, and the tools are remarkably well made. Uh, when I first when they first sent it to me, I was a little bit. You know, because I was like, okay, I've seen these before, I think. Um, but anyway, so I was like, they kept surprising me. They kept working really well. They kept doing what they were meant to do. Um, and so I started chatting with them a little bit more. And so now uh, Vic Teslin Woodworks and Melbourne Tool Company um, are working together. So I'm basically helping them. Um, bring their tools to the North American market. Are they um, like embossing your face on the side of a jack plane? My God, I hope not. I don't know. Because that's not going to sell anything. I think they should. But the reason I tell you this is not to be shameless because that's the last thing I want to be. Um, and that just I, happens naturally. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy working with you guys. And so yeah, yeah. what I've always been big about, big about is, um, is being completely transparent. Yeah, And so uh, if a hand tool question comes my way, uh, it will never turn into, well, at the Melbourne Tool Company, they sell <laughs> wonderful tools. For, um, you know, it's going to be like, you know, it's going to be the same generic advice I've been giving for years. And so, but I, be, you know what I mean? It's, we just announced it on our website. It's on the socials now. And so it's starting to, so I just, I like to let everybody know straight up, listen, I'm doing this stuff. It doesn't change the way I do things or operate. I just like for everybody to know that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw your post. I saw some of the tools. I went to their Instagram page, a really pretty, really nice design, a kind of modern, um, not a direct, um, say inspiration or copy from an existing tool on the market. It seems like they've really gone in and kind of done their own designs, which is nice to see. Right. Yeah, and they they didn't want they didn't want to copy anybody else. Um, you know, the one thing you learn about uh, Melbourne uh, as a city is that they're very artistic and and they they like to do cool work and they like to do cool things. And so, you know, the first order of business was basically designing something that you know wasn't um, wasn't just a direct knockoff. Yeah. Um, you know, and they decided to stick with Bevel Up uh, because to them. The versatility is something that they felt was important, being especially for Australians who work in like Gigi and Red Gum and all these other things. Ha being able to switch up to a high angle quickly is is important. So yeah, well, there's more than a couple toolmakers in Australia, and you've been to Australia. I get a sense there's a pretty healthy woodworking scene there. Oh, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. I mean, I've gone there a number of times um, and I've been to galleries and stuff, uh, furniture galleries that would just blow your mind. Um, and what's cool about them is that not only are they incredible designers, um, but the palette is completely different. So the wood is all different colors. It's not what we're used to seeing the cherries and the walnuts and the, you know, those sorts of colors. What you're seeing is like completely different. And so it just, it's amazing how much just that shift in color hue can really sort of make something stand out. Cool. Yeah. I remember talking to Byrne one time and he was saying that so much of what he does is for um, like interior designers, like custom work for interior designers. And they're, all obsessed with importing in American walnut and he's just because we were talking I was talking about Australian wood he was like I mostly work in like walnut and ash yeah. <laughs> like what <laughs> it's but true. um but when when you see the work of Australian woodwork it, what, th there's that wa what's the um well there's Australian wood review right that's yeah, that's the, the magazine. The yeah. magazine there. And the work in there is fa fantastic. But you're right. It is a t it's a totally different tone, a, d a different set of, of colors. So it's very interesting. Yeah, it's cool. And I, I, was at, I was at Burns' shop the last time I was there. Um, 
and yeah, there's a lot of American woods there. And, uh, and then when you find out what they pay for them. Yeah. Because those are the exotics. Yeah. It's weird to hear, see walnut be, you know, kind of termed as an exotic wood. Yeah, we just we just pay for it like it's an exotic. Yes. <laughs> well, we do, but what we pay for it and what Australians yeah. pay for it, it's like a whole, yeah. <laughs> whole yep. other level. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, should we uh, jump on some questions? Sure. I think so. These are all, uh, I'm just going to pull up chat GPT and put the questions in and have it play back the, the answers. answers. Right, right, Mike? Um, yeah. All right. So this question is from Kevin. I'm interested in diving into some bent lamination and veneer work in the future. And I was wondering if you had a recommendation for a starting size of vacuum bag that may cover the basics. I'm thinking of veneer panels and smaller bent pieces like chair backs and doors. I already have a vacuum pump for stabilizing pot for a stabilizing pot for turning blanks for I phrase that word for turning blanks. Those words go together odd. Um, so I'm just looking for the bag itself. Any advice is appreciated. Um, so I didn't know you had to stabilize pot. I thought <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Um, um, so first off, I worry about the vacuum pump because I know that most people would burn out a vacuum pump that you would use for turning for like, a um, for resin blanks and, and things like that. Um, those are more akin to a vacuum pump that you would use for uh, like HVAC purposes or, or, you know, um, but outside of the, outside of the pump, both of you have experience with bent laminations. What size bags, Mike, do you have your own bag? No, I don't. Okay. I use one at uh, Connecticut Valley. When we do the rocking chair class, we do all bent lambs for the rocker. So that's my, my experience every time I go there and do that, I sort of have to kind of relearn it. But um, in terms of the size of the bag, the other consideration is the size of the platen you're using if you're using that. So even if you have a big bag, you can maybe get by with a four by four platen instead of four by eight, or maybe even something smaller. I don't know, like what are the size increments for? vacuum bags i know they had little tiny kits for like doing skateboards which i think is maybe not the same but can i get a two by four do i have to go four by four no you can get two by four you can get two by three hmm. um you can get quite a few different sizes um and i think the, the the big thing you're right mike the platen is what basically sort of governs what size you're going to be working with um you know a lot of people sort of think, oh, okay, well, I'm going to get a four by eight. But the reality is you're never, ever going to press a four by eight veneer, um, you know, unless you're into making, you know, um, meeting tables and, and, and that kind of stuff. But right. I mean, you think about when you build something, you're always breaking it down into smaller pieces and then you're going to be veneering those pieces individually. Um, <clears throat> so that being said, um, the size that I use most often is a four by two. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be the right size, even for doing sort of bent lamination work. I've got some bent lamination work coming up soon. Uh, and I think the, the bend is going to be too tall um, to use the vacuum system. I'm going to have to go back to good old fashioned clamps. But um, the thing you have to keep in mind is that if you were to just press something flat, and you have a four by two platen, let's say, or a four by three platen, that is only good to press a flat panel. As soon as you get some height to whatever you're working on, so whether, so let's say if you're gonna do a curved front door for a cabinet or something, you know, now maybe your form is, you know, six inches tall. Now you gotta be able to get that in, right? And then when you suck the air out, there can't be any stress at the, at the seams. Cause as soon as you get stress at the seams, the seams pop and then now no vacuum. Hmm. And then that's a real nuisance because a lot, it, they don't seem to like explode 
like, you know what I mean? Like a big rent in the side of the bag. You seem to get a pinhole. <laughs> and then you're there with a little bit of soapy water and trying to find where the it, where it is and fix it and all that other stuff. So, so my answer is it's bigger than you think you need, but don't, don't go the four by eight route because that's just, that's just too much. And then you have to store a four by eight platen right. and all that other stuff. So, I mean, my platen is, I think it's like I said, two by three and I can put that in there and it's, it's fine for doing drawer fronts. And, you know, like he had mentioned, um, you know, doing chair backs and stuff like that. Those are going to be fairly low profile. Um, so yeah, you just have to think about, can you comfortably, you know, I mean, it's almost like a paper bag, you know, you put something in a paper bag and like, do you still have room to like gather the top and then, you know, mm -hmm. close it? You have to have that, that room and closing is another thing. If the thing is too big and you can't get the two pieces to come together, then yeah. you might be in trouble. Um, I think one reason why I would, well, first off, you know, money, uh, a four by eight bag is oh, it's probably ridiculous. absurd. But any time that I've worked with somebody veneering or doing bent lamination or whatever, and you know, camera rolling, it's tough enough to get a panel glued up and wrapped in blue tape to keep things from moving and did it. And you know, you think, oh, well, maybe I can do all of all of my my veneering all in one shot. And, you know, I have a big shop and I can do a four by eight panel and I can do, you know, four or five panels at a time. And it's like, you don't have the open time to be messing around with that much glue surface. Um, I think with the Tim Coleman project that we just did, it was like, I think he did two or three panels and that was him working, you know, to get it into a four by four bag it was a four by eight bag and, um, he only uses half of it. Um, but, uh, I think, I think you're better off sticking with like Vic was saying, a smaller bag that you're going to do one or two panels at a time with, and just, just be gentle with yourself. <laughs> well, when you start doing like different, so for example, the one time I did use a four by eight bag, I borrowed from somebody and I was teaching at, um, I was teaching a skateboard making class and I had eight kids. And so I had eight forms and I had eight sets of veneers and eight of everything. And basically what we did was, is that the first kid did his, um, did his glue up. We put everything onto the, onto the form, put it into the bag, drew out the air and then waited for about 10 minutes. And then the next kid started his. And then that okay. bit of time was enough for it to sort of start to stick. And then we opened up the bag, threw the next one in, drew the air out, and then both were in there. And then we just kept doing that until we got to the eighth one. And then we left it overnight and everything was good. There was no delaminations. There was nothing like that. So, <laughs> so you get used to working in this sort of like, you know, uh, the glue is sort of partially set, not quite ready yet kind of thing. How do you do it with classes, Mike? Or is everyone just like throwing them in at one time? Um, no. So we have like, um, I've made a four bending forms so we can do two sets of rockers at a time. Okay. And we just start those the first day of the class. And so then by the time we get to the fifth day, when we're actually trimming and drilling them, we've got all of the eight or 10 students are already done. That makes sense. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. The best part of that is use the, um, Unibond 800 glue. So it's a two part glue. It's like a resin and a powder that you have to mix together. And so Bob is there and I always let him demonstrate this cause he's more up to speed with the bent lamination. So he's got his big metal mixing bowl and he's got his whisk and like, he's got that chef's technique for like whisking in the bowl. Cause he used <laughs> to be, be like a trained chef. He ran his own restaurant and everything. So it's wow. always cool. I'm always like psyched to see him get the whisk and, and do his little chef whisking of the Unibond 800. I don't know why that's a highlight, but I, I do enjoy that. Um, Tim Coleman, he's a big fan of polyurethane glue with, with veneer. And, you know, we're, we're working. He goes, 
got to go get my, my Gorilla Glue pants on. And he comes out <laughs> and he's got, he's got like a little uniform for like, I'm, I'm veneering. <laughs> and everybody's got like a little, little thing that they do. It seems like when they start pulling out the vacuum bag. All right. So Vic, what is your, since we're talking about it, what is, do you have a bag, um, material of choice? Um, I go with, I can't remember which the cheaper of the two is. There's like, there's vinyl and then there's and then polyurethane polyurethane i think the polyurethane is more expensive right i think so yeah yeah so i don't get the polyurethane i don't use it enough to justify the price difference um i'm happy to deal with a couple of holes here and there um the other thing that bears mentioning too is that um a lot of people sort of freak out when it comes to veneering because if you start looking at the cost of a vacuum pump that is suitable for veneer work and all that other stuff the price can really sort of add up um, and there's a company just down the road in Toronto, Ontario called Roar Rocket um, that basically developed this vacuum system that uses, you know, the little pumps that you use to yeah. suck air out of a wine bottle. Um, so, I mean, the kits are probably like 70 bucks and I think it's like a two by three bag or something like that. It's, you know, you can get ones that are specifically designed for skateboards because that was what they originally started doing. Um, but then they've started making larger bags and they've got different... Um, gizmos now they have like a remote pumping station for guitar makers so that they're not pumping on like the soft sort of um, mm. you know guitar parts and stuff like that um, but yeah so and so that's a really nice tool to explore because it really lowers the sort of barrier to entry and I I only recently got a vacuum pump um, you know for many years I just used the sort of hand pump method <laughs> Yeah, it looks like a um, a vinyl bag, like a two by three vinyl bag from I'm just on vacuumpress dot com, um, like ninety seven dollars, and then the uh, polyurethane is no, it doesn't want to load. Um, One hundred ninety seven dollars, so big difference. Yeah, it's double price. Um, yeah, uh, and are you using like the weird um, like PVC snap on things for for closing up the the end of the bag, Vic? I use, um, so the short answer is no. Um, I have used them. Uh, that's the system that they had at Rosewood when I was there. Um, my bags, for some reason, are too thick. Okay. And so the little C-channel thing doesn't work. So a friend of mine, Steve, who actually wrote a book on veneering, um, he came up with this sort of two-part system where he's got, um, he basically does like a, like a, a bullnose cove on the inside of one stick and does the same on the other side, but then glues a dowel into one side. Huh. And then when you put the two together, they go around the, you put the bag in between and then you just clamp it with a couple of the, you know, the sort of quick grip hmm. clamps or whatever and works like a charm. Huh. So it just kind of pinches between the two halves of the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have, I've definitely sat there wandering around a vacuum bag more than once or twice with a woodworker trying to listen for the, Yes. The, and then, and then like, well, if I hold it right here, it stops. Okay. Let's get a clamp on that and clamp, you know? Yeah. Um, and then my favorite was Craig Thibodeau, who was just like, ah, it just, it just leaks. That's why I have the big pump. And, and he, <laughs> he does so much. He's just like, I couldn't care less right now. Let's just move on right. to something else. <laughs> there you go. So that's yeah. why it's important to make sure that anything you put in the bag the calls, the forms, all that other stuff. They have no edges, no sharp points, no nothing, because it takes very little to get yourself a hole. Bob whacks the corners with a hammer of a panel, right, Mike? What? Bob will take like a square panel and it, it, right before he puts it in the bag, just whack him with a hammer just to, just to dull that edge to keep it from popping the bag. Um, hmm. Well, we didn't do that with what we were doing, but... Oh, um, okay. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> so how much while you're there, Ben, how much is a uh, pump? Um, like the little orange one, I was, I'm not going to lie. I was looking at the little orange one not long ago. Um, little That's orange one, which I kind of want to talk to somebody to see if it would do what I needed to do. I hope it would, uh, is 400. Ouch. So, so that's for a little guy. Okay. Yeah. So it's a one and a half CFM. Uh, the compact 150. That's the one I've got. Is it? Hmm. 
All right, we'll talk off air about this. All right. All right. <laughs> cool. Question number two is from Bill. I've always used my hardware store coping saw to cut my poplar slash pine slash MDF baseboards and crown moldings. I recently bought a fancy fret saw. Not super duper blow a paycheck fancy, but fancy for me. I love that sentence so much. That's great. So that's <laughs> dream- new concepts, not blue spruce. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I was thinking, yeah, I guess it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, I dream about wasting out hardwood dovetails and maybe cutting out some fancy bracket feet for a chest of drawers that I will probably never build. Here's my question. Which way are the coping fret saw blades supposed to face towards the front hand towards the handle or the front? Is it a push or a pull cut? Should I be using those fancy blades that have the teeth that face opposite ways? Is it different for a coping saw compared to a fret saw? Does blade orientation depend on the thickness of the material? I haven't noticed much of a difference either way myself, but maybe there is a right way in this case. Well, as a rule of thumb for me, like a regular coping saw, the idea is that you always want the blade in tension, like no matter what you're doing. So a Japanese pole saw, just a regular dovetail saw, is really, really thin and it has a thin spine because it's in tension. It cuts on the pole stroke. Whereas a Western-style dovetail saw has a really heavy spine to it and usually a thicker plate because it cuts on the push stroke so that blade is in tension. The blade wants to fold or bend so you reinforce it and then start with a really thick blade so i always think of coping saws in the same thing as i want that frame in tension i want the blade in tension so that i'm i'm setting it up so that it cuts on the pull stroke and yeah i think i'm gonna say that's yeah that's right because if you're cutting on the on the push stroke you can imagine that frame you know, bending in a little bit if it's flexible and then making the blade a little bit looser, less taut. So, um, however, the higher quality coping saw, fret saws, I think new concepts is one. They say that the frame is rigid enough to where you can set it up to cut on a push stroke. And it's not going to flex and untension the blade. So um, I think rule of thumb, you set it up to cut as a, as a pole saw. And, but uh, if you want to set it up to cut as a, as a push saw on a better coping or fret saw um, with a more rigid frame, that's good. Why would you want to do that? Um, it kind of has to do with, as you're sawing uh, with a push stroke, all the swarf, the sawdust is getting pushed to the opposite side um, of the face. So typically if you're working with a show face toward you with a push saw, you're getting a cleaner face on your side, maybe slightly more ragged face on the opposite side. So again, cutting with a pull stroke, if you're pulling the sawdust towards you, technically you can get not as clean as of a surface. Um, yeah, that that's about it. The one thing is if you have a fret saw and you're trying to cut, you know, the waist between pins on dovetails on hardwoods of, you know, three quarter of an inch thick furniture size pieces, you're probably going to be outmatched. You're probably going to want to go to a coping saw instead of a fret saw. Vic? Uh, yeah, I think that um, whether you push or pull really is – a personal preference. If you have a decent coping saw, they should be able to handle it either way. Um, but um, I personally like to pull them uh, because I find that I have a lot more control that way. Um, in fact, um, you know, I've sort of started to pull a lot of tools, um, whether it be like a plane or a saw or what have you. Um, so I just find that, especially when you're uh, like a coping saw, um, or, or, or a fret saw, um, you know, it doesn't, you know, cutting a straight line with it is, it's a bit of a challenge. And so I find that I have more control as to what that thing is doing if I'm pulling it towards me. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think that blade orientation matters. I don't think buying a specialty blade is important. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, whatever, 
whatever blades I kind of get. I, it's more about the size of the kerf it has to go into. Um, you know, if you cut furniture size dovetails, you know, like Mike was suggesting at three quarters of an inch or whatever. And if you do that with a, if you do that with a, um, a Japanese saw, um, you're not going to be able to get a very big blade into that kerf. And you're basically going to have to create your own kerf as you're cutting in, um, in order to get that to work because, um, the blade will be so fine to get in there. Um, so in that case, you know, that's a good argument for using a Western style saw on larger dovetails, because then you end up with a nice size kerf and then you can take a coping saw blade and just cut right out. Um, I don't know if cope and maybe maybe one of you guys knows, but I don't I don't know if there's different sized coping saw blades or if coping saw blades are a size where fret saw blades are, of course, different sizes. But um, I've always whenever I use a coping saw, um, I just get coping saw blades. And um, again, they're not oriented, you know, with reversing teeth or anything like that. Um, they're really just, they're there to just quickly waste away the, what I don't want. I'm not really concerned about the surface because I'm at least a millimeter or so away from the line. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to go at that with a, with a chisel later anyway. Um, and oftentimes if I've scribed my dovetail lines, um, any bit of like whiskering or whatever is just going to break off, um, before it can go, you know, further. So yeah, I'd so, say, yeah. Um, so coping saw uh, blades, I tend to go, relatively speaking, you know, anywhere from fine to medium. I stay away from the really coarse coping saw blades because they can really chip out. Oh, so um, they do make different coarseness of... Coarseness, yeah. And I, I do know that some brands also have like a little thinner plate to that. I know, was it Chris Gochner who always liked the Craftsman coping saw blades because he found... The thing about why you do want to use the fret saws, um, often you can just drop that saw, uh, the fret saw blade all the way down to almost the bottom of your handsaw curve, just kind of make a left hand turn and just saw straight across where coping saw is normally too thick for the saw curve. So you have to do that kind of X cut and you're cutting twice as much and leaving a little bit bigger hump of waste in there. Um, but I have used on occasion coping saw blades, which were a little bit thinner enough to get down into a regular saw kerf. Um, yeah, it, but the oh, craftsman so I, blade. I was sorry. just going to say to finish the thought. So for fret saws, I go relatively speaking coarser. So I think I go twelve TPI, twelve to fifteen TPI for a fret saw, which is pretty. Um, which is fairly coarse and, and cuts pretty well. The smaller teeth, what happens, you cut more slowly, also build up more heat and friction with the blade. And once you do that, the blade starts to expand and get uh, kind of detensioned as well. But I don't get, some of the fret saw blades are the blades that you just use for a scroll saw with the teeth going in the opposite direction. So it's always sort of cutting, going up or down. Um, I've used those in a fret saw and I have, huge problems with those. So I definitely want to get fret saw teeth where they're all going in the same direction. I don't want to do that kind of uh, very direction teeth. Hmm. So yeah, Chris used, um, I'd be curious to what he uses now because I don't think they're available anymore. Right. But um, Chris used Craftsman coping saw blades. And for that very reason, they were just thin enough to drop into uh, a dovetail saw kerf. And I finished a video with him and went to Sears and bought 10 packs, I think. And um, so uh, that's what I use in my coping saw. I, I do mine on the push stroke with a coping saw because just about the only time I'm going to use a coping saw is for wasting out dovetails. And in my head, I want to see the show face. I want that facing me in the vise and there's going to be more tear out on the backside and I'm less worried about it there. So that I, my coping saw is always, um, Western, if you will, cutting on the push stroke, my fret saws I use for, um, marquetry and they are on the pole stroke because I'm using a, um, birds, what do you, what do you call those birds mouth? Yeah. Um, jig or whatever fixture. 
And, and so I am cutting when I'm cutting with a fret saw, normally I'm cutting with the piece horizontally and I'm standing over it and I'm, and the handle is beneath the piece and I'm, I'm doing it that way. Yeah. So you're yeah. in essence referencing off the opposite or the face furthest away from the handle. So you're. Yes. But the, yeah. the teeth are always going to, are always facing away from the show face in my, right. in my yeah. work. So that, that's the way that I do the two. Um, uh, there are definitely times that I find myself swapping them around and it just, it's, you know, whatever I'm doing, whatever it needs to be, that's what I'm, swap the blade to do you know yeah. so which you can do in a fret saw but not a table saw you will <laughs> just just i'm just putting that out there i've seen it done i i, I i'm pretty sure everybody has put a table saw blade in backwards at some point well right? i didn't say i did uh-huh <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> um all right well oh and by the way i uh just went on just because i'm doing the research while we're talking. Uh, I am on olsonsaw.net, which is my place of choice because they are in my hometown right down the road. And um, so you've got anywhere from, for coping saw blades, they have, oh, okay. Um, they have a 24 TPI extra fine that is 0.018. Uh, wide and then they have so they have different widths they have a 0 0.1 0 0.018 skip tooth fine 16 tpi and 18 fine 0 0.018 so that would probably fit in a dovetail hmm. slot maybe maybe we need to swing down there and uh drive down stony hill road sometime during lunch and yeah. pick some up so all right uh let's take a quick break Hey, I'm Joshua Klein. And I'm Mike Uptograph. And we're from Mortise and Tenon Magazine, all about hand tool woodworking. We put out two issues per year and always ad free. It's more like a hefty journal. And we publish our own books and courses and even the Mortise and Tenon podcast. We're all about hand tool craftsmanship for the 21st century. If this is up your alley, you should check out our website at mortiseandtenonmag.com. I have one. What you got, Ben? Sometimes blame the tool. Sometimes blame the tool? Yeah. I like that. I'm yeah, frustrated. Like I'm very, very frustrated right now because uh, I, uh, I'm supposed to be a woodworking podcast. I'm going to talk Luther for a minute. I, I bought um, a radius dish or two and uh, so that when you, you – push a piece of, I'll use woodworking terms, when you push a, th a piece of veneer into the thing and glue things to it, it will, it'll, it'll take that radius. And um, I bought one about 18 months ago and uh, I, we have the CNC now and I thought, oh, you know what? I can make a 15 foot radius uh, routing template for me to uh, route the back of of this piece and then it'll fit into the 15 foot radius dish. And so I pull it off the CNC and it doesn't, the radiuses aren't anywhere near one mm. another. And, um, I had not been happy with the radius I was getting on my ukuleles that I was building. And it turned out that my 15 foot radius dish is a 22 foot radius dish. And, um, so I contact the, the person I bought it from and I said, Hey, you know, you sent me two 20 inch, 20, 20 foot radius dishes. And, and they said, well, you, when you bought that, I was crazy busy. Yeah. That that's distinctly possible that that happened. Let me make you a new one. And, um, uh, so I decided to, okay, I'm just going to put this project on hold because in two weeks I'll have a new radius dish. And that was, I think, nine weeks ago. Wow. Because every step along the way, I am a week or two away from having my radius dish. Reach out. Oh, yeah, sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, blah, 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 blah. So UPS comes today. It ain't 15 feet. 
it ain't anywhere near it again. It's not 20, but it's not 15. And I am very, very frustrated right now. So I am going to make my own radius dishes these days. (laughs) So is the radius, is it, is it like a round dish or is it like a U shaped channel? It's a round dish. So it's, you know, is that something you can make on the CNC? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to, um, yeah, you could easily just, you know, plug in, you could easily make a, a 15 foot sphere in, in CAD and then subtract that from a piece of wood and then make it do the thing. Yeah. Um, I think it takes forever to do. Uh, you have to, you know, bullnose bits and give it a billion passes so that it, it, you know, the facets eventually equal something smooth ish. Mm -hmm. Um, or you can, uh, route out ribs with a 15 foot radius and glue them on a platen, um, you know, radially, and then take a piece of, uh, eighth inch hardboard or something and suck that down and glue those down to the ribs and basically make a torsion box that instead of flat is the exact opposite of flat. It has a radius in it. And I think that's where I'm leaning right now, but Mm. Yes, I'm very frustrated. This is one of those, like, it would be way easier to make jigs and things on the CNC and the 3D printer if my dish was the radius it was supposed to be. So That's frustrating. Yes. Yes, especially after waiting over two months for the replacement. And so that's uh, not blame the tool. That's blame the tool maker. Yeah, and I don't know. I, it's... I, I've had friends who say, oh, they warp eventually anyways. And then, right. but then when I discovered that my two radius dishes, which were supposed to be five feet radius apart, were exactly the same radius. Um, that was, that was a fulfillment error. And now I just don't know what it is, but hmm. now it's just frustrating. So. Sorry to hear it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Mike, what have you been working on? You're in class world, aren't you? Uh, I, well, I've been making a, um, kind of in class mode. I'm teaching a kind of entry table class that I just photoshopped a picture of another piece of furniture and said, Hey, this is what we're teaching. Um, then I actually had to make the thing before in order to prep all the parts and stuff for classes. So I've been making a, an entry table out of walnut and I had some walnut around my shop and I had just enough to get the entire table out of what I had, which was really good because I didn't want to go out and buy more walnut. Um, And yes, if I, you know, you lay out all the parts correctly so you know what all your cuts are and what you have to rip first before you can cross cut. And I took a board over to my chop saw, I saw the line and boom, I made a cross cut. And that just meant that I had a very sizable chunk of walnut that was, you know, just not quite 48 inches long for a tabletop. So it was like, oh. Um, so I went from having all the wood to having enough for the base. And that's good. So I got everything for the base, I told myself. And you'll just go to the lumber yard and just buy some nice walnut for the top, which you should have done anyway. And which is what I ended up doing. It was fine. But just that, that making the wrong cut at the wrong time. And then right after you did it, you knew you did it and there ain't nothing you can do about it. So, and then I felt bad. I was over at the lumber yard and they pulled down a pile um, of walnut and the top is like, 48 inches. So if I had like nine foot boards, I could cut it in half and get my top out of a single board. But like all the boards were like seven and a half feet long. So it's like, oh, so I had even more waste. And I was, I wasn't in a bad mood, but it just looked like all the walnut they had just looked horrible. It was like naughty and funky and sappy and wavy. And I was kind of in a bad mood. By the time I got the walnut picked out, um, went up front to pay for it, and and um, it was waiting on the forklift for me to throw it in my car. And then once it was out in the sunlight, I looked at it. It's like, oh no, this is nice. I don't. I shouldn't have been complaining <laughs> so much about the state of the walnut. But uh, anyway, 
worked out well. I like the table. It, um, uh, I was able to make it dry fit it, get it into my house. In fact, I had Ben and Amanda over and just saying, Hey, come here, critique this table. So I think I kind of put uh, Amanda on the spot, like, Hey, come in here and tell me what's wrong with this piece of furniture, Amanda. And it's like, um, it's the correct answer. Nothing. It's like, so, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I've been working on my own, uh, tables and, um, I had this huge, um, this huge elm tree that we took down at, you know, at uh, two houses ago. Um, and so I had it sawed up and, um, it's been drying and it's doing its thing. And so now it's, it's r at the right time to start using it. And so, um, I'm doing these, a set of, um, side tables for our own sofa. Um, and you know, they're going to be sort of squarish at the front and then it's going to it's going to blend back into a curve and then sort of almost be like half of a demi loon table, a quarter loon table, maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, and there's going to be bent laminations for, for the undercarriage and, and all that other kind of stuff. But what I really wanted to do was to be able to have like a single piece top. Um, and so this, um, this uh, elm that I have is 17 inches wide and the design calls for 15, which is, great except for that i don't have any machines that i can stuff a 15 inch wide piece of anything into and so i think one of the best things in woodworking to have is a friend who does have big machines yes um and so i went to the and he owns a a, a very popular local lumber yard here um and he had a machine there now i, I mean Maybe I'm naive. Maybe I don't. I haven't seen a lot of different machines in the woodworking world before. But this machine, um, so it basically has two cutter heads in it. It has one at the front and one at the back. And the first cutter head is jointing the board. And then the second cutter head is thicknessing the board. So that basically it's doing the bottom and the top of the board at the same time. And these boards, like Elm, in my experience, does not dry flat. Um, you know, you end up with quite a bit. So I had probably a quarter of an inch of twist in these 32-inch long boards. Um, it went through that machine once, and it came out dead flat. And yeah. I was like, what kind? Of, and this is a massive machine. Um, I, I posted about it on my Instagram and I have like picture or video of this thing running. Um, but I mean, like it would take up most people's shops, <laughs> like that's yeah. how big it is. But I mean, I, I was just like, that is an incredible machine. And I mean, you know, when you find out how much they're worth and you know, all that other stuff, you start to realize, okay, this is really for industry. This is, sure. you know, like this guy not only does he have this lumber yard, but he also prepares lumber. He prepares stair treads for mm -hmm. contractors to install solid wood stair treads. And like, he can literally just chuck a piece of wood into this thing and it just does what it needs to do. And then he puts it through a gang rip saw, which cuts it into like specific widths. And then they glue all those up and make stair treads. And then the last machine is this, it's a planer head it was the first thing that it hits. Then a, coarse sander and a fine sander <laughs> all in a row and like you just stick like the stair tread goes in with like glue and everything and it comes out a stair tread <laughs> it's like but i mean really when you think about it like if you had to make stair treads for your own house and you walked in your shop and there's like a stack of you know yeah white oak you'd be like why did i volunteer to do this <laughs> yeah but i mean for your own house okay i can do that but right but you wouldn't want to make a living off it exactly no. right and you answered a really big question i had about those machines and that i knew about the cutter head top and bottom but i thought if there's cutter head top and bottom there's no reference so if you put in a banana it's just going to come out a thinner smoother banana but you said that the heads were offset front to back that made a lot of sense you you are doing it in sequence you are creating a, a flat reference face on the bottom before it hits the, in essence, the planer head toward the back. Oh, that's Cause cool. what happens is, is there like at the beginning, there are like these fingers 
that push down on the board and then it basically keeps it nice and level for that first cutter head. Right. But then the, then the reference table now is top dead center of that cutter. Right. So then when yeah. it comes off of that cutter, now it's referencing off of a, of another flat surface. Right. For the next one. Then you can do the top. Very cool. It was brilliant. I thought it was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, you know, they're a couple of $10,000, but, I feel like I've always seen them called like is the brand a Strato plane or something like that? Like no, it's this some one was like, like a weird can tech. Oh, okay, you know, it, right. it just struck me as the name of a company that makes huh, industrial. Gotcha. But I think it's called a dual head planer or something like that, or gotcha. dual surface planer maybe. Um, anyway, he was explaining it to me how it ran, and he was showing me all like there was too many buttons on it for me. I. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I had to be like a, like a, a college trained cabinet maker, I'd never make it. There's too many buttons. There's too many. <laughs> All right. Let's hit this question from Robert. Um, thanks to Ben for the video comparing the three strengths of ammonia relative to fuming oak. And thanks to Chris Gochner for his related article in issue 282. Uh, for the record, I think my video is related to the Gochner article. Um, but I've never done this before, so I'm a bit apprehensive. First, I tried a bunch of samples using the household strength ammonia. Even after two weeks, the darkening color change was somewhat subtle. Then I got 10% janitorial strength, and it was crazy. Two days darkened the wood beyond the darkest walnut. I'm finding that 6 to 12 hours on my samples gives a rich brown. But here's the rub. My project wood is not all from the same tree or even from the same source, perhaps not even the same species, white oak, swamp white oak, coastal white oak. So am I likely to wind up with a variety of shades on the final piece? Perhaps I should fume the pieces individually before assembly so that I take some pieces out earlier and leave other pieces to fume to, to the same shade. Am I overthinking this? No. Not at all. Um, <laughs> that is, I mean, fuming is awesome. It's really great. It's the color penetrates the surface. You can't sand through it. Um, it's a wonderful thing. It maintains the the clarity of the wood because you're not putting pigments on top of the surface. But to your point, every tree is going to have a different can tannin content, and that tannin content is going to affect its reaction to ammonia. So, um you are going to get color variations unless you're buying boards from the same flitch, meaning you've got a whole log that of white oak boards that you're working from, which is great, but rarely the case. So I would say try to be strategic about where you're using wood within a piece. Like I, ideally, if this is a little table, you kind of want to try to get the top from you know, either, you know, lengths of the same board or a couple boards from the same tree uh, for uniform color. You're probably going to get all of your legs, let's say, out of a, a single eight-quarter board. If you can get all of your aprons and stuff from another board, then at least even if you have tonal uh, variation, it's going to make sense. It's going to be logical. The whole piece is still going to hang together okay. Uh, you know, the worst is if you're doing a lot of panel glue ups with mismatched boards and you kind of have this striping. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to, you're what you would have to do if you know you're using multiple boards from multiple sources and you want to put multiple sample offcuts in your tent as you're fuming and then sort of pull, I don't know, I guess you're fuming independently. Yeah, I don't know. That's super hard. Um, I think a better strategy is that you're not trying to get everything to match perfectly. You just want to, if you, if there is a difference, tone down the difference a little bit. And so what I do is I'll use typically a wiping varnish like water locks, but I will get some asphaltum, which is basically roofing tar and basically tint my finish with that. So I'm not staining it and completely doing away with the benefit of fuming, but I find by using a tinted finish, it just brings everything a little closer together and introduces a uniform tone, which even if the boards are slightly lighter or darker, that that overall kind of tone or tint is going to kind of make the whole thing hold together. So I think the idea is rarely um, 
trying to get it to match match. I think the only exception is that sapwood does not fume at all. And you can have boards that look nice and then you fume it and all of a sudden you have these little slivers of sapwood. Get yourself a little, a small kit of like artist oil so it'll have just a few tube, tubes of paint. You want to seal the surface and then get like a, um, I'll use like a Danish oil. You could use a Watco wiping varnish. And then you'll kind of use the oil pigments to create a tint mixture and kind of put it on. And you, there you're applying it just locally to those high contrast sapwood areas. I've done that. And again, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Just get something to where it's not going to draw the eye anymore and call it good. And then you can continue with your top coat. So yeah, a lot of stuff con to consider, but I do still think it's worth fuming as opposed to jumping right into uh, stains and dyes and that kind of stuff. I always thought that you did a garnet shellac over a sure. fumed finish. Yeah, so the garnet uh, fuming often leaves it a little bit of a kind of a coolish, greenish, greenish cast to the wood. So I'll do a coat of garnet shellac, and just the orange in that will counteract the green and just bring it, warm it up a little bit before I do my top coat on top of that. Yep. Okay. Vic, do yeah, you have I, much experience fuming? Yeah, I have. I don't have a lot of experience with fuming. Uh, but I have done it, and um, and I, I think everything that Mike said makes complete sense. Um, totally worth doing it, especially if that's the look you're going for. And in some cases, if you're doing craftsman-style furniture, it's period accurate and um, and all those sorts of things. Um, and and I've done also that trick where you mix some pigment with oils in order to kind of get a, I had to do it on a cherry. I had one leg that had a little bit of sap and it would have just driven me crazy. Um, it was, I even put it at the back and I still like every time I saw it, it made me angry. And so I had to fix it. Um, but uh, the one thing I will say uh, is do be careful uh, working with janitorial strength um, um, material, the ammonia, because um, I remember um, somebody that was in the room didn't have an organic mask on when somebody popped the tent. They didn't check to make sure everybody was masked up, and it knocked them right out. So especially when there's like a, like a, a concentration in a tent, yeah. Um, you know, you get, you, you open that up, you, you burp that tent open and whoa. So you got to be really careful. You got to make sure that, I mean, N95 mask is not going to cut no. it. No, you know, not at all. No, you it need does an nothing. organic, it, yeah. you know, respirator. Um, and so, and, and for a lot of people, that's a reason why they don't use it. Um, I've had very limited experience with some of the sort of chemical, um, like for example, Monocoat has a fuming agent, right. um, that basically, um, does the same thing. Well, claims to do the same thing that fuming does, but more of like with a chemical reaction with the, um, with the wood where you're just applying it and it's not like a caustic smell or anything like that. So I've had a little bit of experience with that and more just out of pure curiosity. I was like, Oh, I wonder if this works. Right. Um, and, and it does. Uh, is it period accurate? And if somebody was like wanting to match the fumed, the actual fumed look, is it going to be the same? I don't know uh, because I don't, I'm, that's not my thing. But um, I, I think like there's other, there's other options available as well. Um, you know, so that don't involve using a pigment stain. I agree hundred percent with what Mike says. As soon as you put a pigment stain on something, you dull everything right down um, it, and, you know, you might as well milk paint it, um, you know, because in some cases milk paint has less pigment than, <laughs> than, than these stains do. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's miraculous. I just think it's amazing that you can, uh, and I remember when I was in school, we tried different woods. We tried mahoganies, we tried sapeles, we tried like all these different woods to see how they reacted and they all did in some case, in some way. But I just think it's really cool that you can, you know. I don't know, but can you, is like, if you have a cat, can you just like set up a tent around their litter box? Like, is that enough? <laughs> 
just just put a rack and put your oak right. on top of the and litter put your box oak and, in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe a couple of sticks <laughs> to prevent it from being like yeah, actually yeah, yeah. in the. Yeah. How often do you change your litter box? <laughs> well, I don't. I I, he I have a dog. One. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't pee in a box. But um, yeah, I, I think if you got enough fumes in a litter box to fume oak. You have other issues you need to be dealing with in your life, I think. That's true, yeah. If you're like one of the cat people that have like, you know, 20, 30 cats in one litter box, I guess maybe. Yeah. But to put that ammonia in context, so household ammonia is typically 3% um, janitorial strength, which I use um, now is 10%. And I agree, you get plenty of tone in a pretty reasonable amount of time. And then the industrial... Um, ammonium hydroxide is 28%. That is nasty that you need to be super careful about that. So, yeah, I would think so because like I've only ever used the 10% and I can't, Im <laughs> I couldn't imagine 28%. Yeah. Sorry. It is 28%. Yes. What you um, got? I've got from the Chris Gochner article. I've got the yes, bottle of that's ammonium the nasty hydroxide. Stuff. So, like, if you unscrew the lid and give it a sniff, no. it's going to be really smelly. No, no, no. You're not okay. doing that. You're not doing that. I was going to um, give it a give it a whiff, then. No, so well, Mike actually, and I will end the show. <laughs> I will say, I will say, this is three years old now. I used this not that long ago. It has significantly toned itself down. It is not. Yeah, um, ammonia eventually turns to water. I think. Yeah. I would say this is probably closer to 10 than mm -hmm. 28 right now. Um, I used it and it was like, Oh, there's hardly any sting to this process at all. But, um, when that bottle was new, um, I had an, uh, the appropriate mask, uh, the appropriate respirator, I should say. And, um, I use goggles with vents on the side and I didn't think about it. Oh yeah. And I opened the bottle and immediately started tearing and could barely see anything. Yeah. Um, the goggles do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's serious stuff. Really it's serious, serious stuff. serious stuff. And, um, I so think for in, goggles, if you use like the, the swimmers sealed goggles, off goggles. goggles. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, honestly, I, I, went to use it over in this corner of the shop and immediately realized there's no way that this is going to stay in my shop. And I took it out to our potting shed and it was, I mean, if that video proved to me that there's never a reason in my book to get anything stronger than janitorial strength. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and jan janitorial strength, I don't know where you found your, well, you're in Canada, but, um, I have to go to a, a ACE hardware. Mm -hmm. And they sell it. That's the only place I can find it. But like every Ace Hardware has it. Um, home centers, um, I haven't been able to find it. But the only difference in tone really was, you know, the the twenty eight percent was faster. Yeah. And it went deeper. It went straight through the pieces, my test pieces, which were you know sticks. So there yeah. were you know only three quarters of an inch square on on four sides. Um, but there's no reason for that. You know, the, even, even with, uh, with the, the janitorial strength, you would still be able to like smooth plane a piece after the fact and you'd be totally fine. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, be super, super careful. And I actually, so I've got two recommendations, um, tied to this. And one of them is an Instagram account that is, um, what is there? It's Catherine Sullivan or it's K Sullivan restoration. Um, and they have, they do incredible work, uh, re furniture restoration work. Uh, they work with, uh, Patrick Edwards and, um, that whole crew out on the West coast. And Catherine had posted a video today from, uh, it is another Instagram account, chem.thug. And it is this chemist sharing videos and telling you about, the dangerous things going on in the video and whatnot. And he today had shared a video of a, an ammonia tanker spill and mm. took you through the history of ammonia and how it's made. And, but you know, it was like one of those three minute videos that was just 
you you end the video and you're like, I am so much smarter now than I was three minutes ago. Yes. So um like to recommend both of those Instagram accounts. But cool. Yeah, get get in industrial strength and stick with it. Um if you are worried about the fumes when you're opening a tent, uh I have heard uh an unnamed woodworker will take a shop vac and stick it under stick the hose under the tent and have an exhaust hose far away from him and evacuate the air before he opens up the tent. Um, so that would, you know, if you need to stick that out of a window or whatever, that's a good way of, of getting rid of those fumes quickly too. So yeah. Cool. Anybody got anything else? I think that about does it for this episode. Yeah. Jeez. Well, I have a, a music recommendation. Ooh. The band is called bad, bad, not good. And uh, you, every band went, you recommend has like weird names, dude. Yeah, I know. My daughter went and saw them live the other day at a festival in our city, and she said, Dad, these guys are amazing. And so I've been checking them out, but yeah, they're pretty cool. So kind of jazzy, but like very sort of new age and fun. And so that's my recommendation for this week cool. bad, bad, not good. Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Thank you so much to Vic and Mike for joining me. And thank you to those of you who have gifted fundamentals of woodworking journeys to new woodworkers in your lives. If you want to give fundamentals of woodworking, head on over to findwoodworking.com slash fundamentals. Also, findwoodworking.com slash e-learning to get $25 off Matt Monaco's bowl turning class. It's fantastic. It just went live. You've got plenty of time to catch up. If you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up button. If you feel called to do so, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It helps spread the word and be safe in the shop. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. It's like my report card when I was in grade school. <laughs> bad, bad, not good. <laughs> yeah.